Welcome to lecture 22. In this lecture, I will talk about how to set up a quantum field theory for a complex scalar field. Recall that in lecture seven, we set up the QFT partition function for a single real scalar field phi. It was given as z is the path integral over the field phi times the exponential of minus the Euclidean classical action. The classical action itself was constrained by identifying symmetries that we wanted for the field theory, such as having only terms that are consistent with special relativity. Restricting to second order in derivatives, we found that for a real scalar field, we could write down a Euclidean action that consisted of a kinetic term, the two derivative term, and a potential term V of phi. In the present lecture, I would like to discuss what changes to the um, quantum field theory if we allow the field phi to be no longer real, but instead be a complex scalar field. Again, for a, ring, for a single real scalar field, the invariance under Lorentz transformations restricted the terms of the classical actions. This is what the result that was shown in the previous slide really means. If we consider now a complex scalar field instead of a weird field, we can also generalize the action that was given in equation 22.2. We know that physical observables such as the uh, pressure, for instance, um, do not have in general imaginary parts, so we expect the partition function to be real as well. If the partition function is expected to be real, the simplest way to enforce this is if we say that the action itself SE has to be real as well. If the action SE has to be real, it must be built out of quadratic forms such that, um, so for instance, having something like phi phi star, where phi star denotes the complex conjugation of phi. If we put together the requirement that the action is Lorentz invariant and that it is real and that it is built out of the scale, complex scalar field phi, we find that an action of the form given in equation 22.3 works, where we have a quadratic form for the kinetic term and we have a form of the potential that involves only the combination phi phi star. Since it is instructive to consider a situation where the action for the complex scalar field is close to that of the real scalar field, we consider an action that is um, given by the following form. It has a, a mass term that uh, comes again with the um, quadratic field phi phi star, and it has a phi four in the action that we write in terms of the complex scalar field as phi phi star squared. Writing down this action, we find that besides the requirement such that the action is real and is invariant under Lorentz transformation, this particular form here has an additional symmetry. In particular, if we consider transformations where phi goes to e to the i alpha phi and correspondingly phi star goes to e to the minus i alpha phi star with arbitrary but constant parameter alpha, the action 22.4 is invariant under this transformation. We will explore the consequence of this additional symmetry in future lectures. For the time being, let us now aim at investigating the complex scalar field action and the resulting partition function. Since phi is complex, we can always separate it into a real and an imaginary component. And the way we do this is that we say phi is equal to one over square root of two times phi one plus i phi two, where we expect both phi one and phi two to be purely real. In terms of these components, the action given in equation 22.4 is given in the following form. So we have one half times the derivative, the two derivative term of phi one, one half the two derivative term of phi two, m squared phi one squared, m squared phi two squared, and then lambda times phi one squared plus phi two squared squared. Similarly, the action 
um, sorry, similarity partition function in this case is given as the path integral over phi one and phi two of e to the Euclidean action specified in equation 22.7. So what we find is that when we express it in components, the action for the complex scalar field looks very much like two copies of the real scalar field. Let me go back. We have here um, a kinetic term for a single real scalar field, a mass term for a single real scalar field, and there's one term that looks like five one to the fourth, and then there are some terms that look exactly the same way for the second um, component phi two. The only sort of um, difference is that there's also a term that couples phi one to phi two through this um, interaction term here. So besides this interaction term, the cross term, which is two lambda phi one squared phi two squared, we just have two identical copies of a scalar field theory. If we drop the um, interaction term completely, we can investigate what happens then. Uh, then we just have a free complex scalar field. And um, we can see what happens to, in particular, the partition function for this theory. For the free complex scalar field, defined as the action of the scalar field evaluated at lambda is zero, this separates into two components, where the first component is just a function or functional of the scalar field phi one. And then we have an additional contribution that's just a function of the scalar field phi two, where this S naught here is nothing else but the Euclidean action for a free scalar field where the scalar is real. Plugging this result into the path integral, we find that the path integral um, the partition function for the free complex scalar field is written in the following form because we have these two terms here in the exponent um, that sort of separate, the whole integral factorizes into two parts. So we find that this is a path integral over the component phi one times a path integral over the component phi two. Clearly both of those are nothing else but the partition function of the real scalar field. So we find that the partition function for the complex scalar field um, in the free theory case is nothing else but the partition function of the real scalar field in the free case squared. Now that means that since the pressure is defined as the logarithm of the partition function over beta v, we find that the pressure of the free complex scalar field um, given as the logarithm of the uh, complex partition function is just given as the as twice the logarithm of the real scalar partition function. And this is nothing else but twice the, the pressure of the free scalar field itself. In the case of vanishing mass, we can use the result given in lecture 11 for the free uh, pressure of a real scalar field, which in the renormalized case is just this pi squared t4 over 90. And we find that the complex scalar field pressure then is just given as twice this, it's just given as pi squared t4 over the 45. Let's now discuss the physics behind this result. So for a real scalar field in the free limit, we find that the pressure is given as pi squared t4 over 90. For the complex scalar field, we find it's pi squared t4 over 45 because it just corresponds to twice the pressure of a free scalar field or the pressure of two real scalar fields, which it is. It's easy to generalize this expression to n free scalar fields that are real. And we find that the pressure of n real scalar fields is just n times pi squared t4 over 90 because every free scalar field contributes pi squared t4 over 90 to the pressure. In the following, we will sometimes call this one bosonic degree of freedom, where bosonic just refers to the fact that we are dealing with scalar degrees of freedom here. Turning the argument around, we can use an expression for the pressure to measure the number of degrees of freedom of a system. Specifically, if we are given a pressure P of T at some temperature T, we can define the number of degrees of freedom DOF, 
as the pressure times 90 divided by pi squared over T4. Clearly, the pressure could be a function that's not um, an integer when you divide it uh, by this uh, pi squared T4 and multiply by 90. So degrees of freedom here does not have to be an integer value. It is some effective degree of freedom. And the concept of effective degree of freedom makes sense in various contexts in physics. So for instance, in cosmology, the number of degrees of freedom just changes as a function of time. Namely, at very early times, um, you might have uh, constituents that are basically the SU2 gauge fields, but at lower temperature, some of these degrees of freedom um, no longer exist. They are basically bound into other degrees of freedom, such as the W and Z bosons. Then at even lower uh, energies, we have gluons. Um, if we lower the temperature further, the gluons are no longer are uh, effective degrees of freedom that are relevant. They are bound into what are known as hadrons. Um, and basically, we can do a history of the universe depending on the number of degree of freedom that are uh, effectively available at a given temperature t. This can be summarized in the following plot here that is uh, available at this uh, publication. And basically what it is, it's, it's showing the number of degrees of freedom, effective number of degree of freedom, g star, as a function of the, um, the temperature of the universe, which is running from high temperature to the left to low temperature on the right. And uh, at very high temperature, the number of degrees of freedom defined in a slightly more general way than in the last uh, uh, slide, but nevertheless in a very similar fashion, runs from something slightly more than 100 and then decreases because um, fewer and fewer number of degrees of freedom are available. Then at some point we have uh, what is known as the uh, QCD phase transition. This is where um, basically gluons and quarks get bound into nuclei. And uh, we sort of see this happening or going along with a steep drop in the number of degrees of freedom. And then we have sort of similar features again when we have um, decoupling, where basically nuclei get bound into uh, atoms again. Note that um, the effective number of degrees of freedom, which we have discussed, was based on the pressure. That's just one possible definition. It's shown in the blue line here. There are other definitions possible, for instance, based on the energy density or the entropy density or the number density. Um, basically, all of these make sense, um, but all of them also, which is shown in this figure, um, all of them also sort of show a similar behavior for the effective number of degrees of freedom, for instance, in the history of the universe. And this concludes the present lecture.